Today we're playing the post game of Pokemon Xenoverse, the best fan game I've personally ever played, and you guys seem to enjoy it quite a bit as well. So get ready to feel all kinds of emotions, from pain to happiness, sadness, and everything under the sun, because this post game has everything you want. It's up there with AAA games, you cannot compare this to any other Pokemon game, but I do highly recommend checking up on the lore on Xenoverse, you can do that by either playing it yourself, reading on it, or watching my video. This post game was released in five different DLCs and the last one came out back in April, so now we can experience it fully. Before we jump into it, don't forget to subscribe because we're still trying to hit that big 500k by the end of the year and we're going to go all out in this next month so you're not going to want to miss that. If we could smash 6,000 likes for this incredible boss game, that would be amazing as well, but now it's time for us to enter the Xenoverse for a second time. We wake up in our room just after becoming the chosen champion, and our mom and dad are waiting for us downstairs because we have to head to a party that Aster is hosting back at his lab. He's throwing this party because today is the day he finally becomes a fully fledged professor, and because he's basically been my mentor throughout the entirety of the Xenoverse story, we have to go and congratulate him. So like a happy family, we head over to the lab and Aster greets us. We apologize for being a little bit late, but he doesn't really mind because we get away with everything as we're the chosen one. After a little chat is over, we start mixing with the crowd, we see that Texaro is here, all the members of Guys have been invited, and of course two of our best friends Alice and Ginger are here as well. Once we're done catching up with everybody, we go and talk to Aster who is super happy that he can finally become a real Pokemon professor, and it's only because we beat him as champion that he's able to do this. He has stepped away from that position and somebody else is going to come in his place, but he's now also going to guide new trainers on their paths to becoming Pokemon Masters. He'll be giving them access the three new starter Pokemon, Croakling, Chiripe, and Inflant. I decided to go with the grass one because he just looks like Batman. Then all of a sudden, Aster gets a phone call telling him to come to Route 10 because there is an emergency there. He asks me if we can come with him because we could be of very good use here. We don't really know what's going on, but we have to follow him blindly because he's going to have to cut the party short anyway. On our way to Route 10, we end up running into one of those Pokemon dens again, which I'm going to be completing with Shyly on. And just a couple of feet away from the den, we meet up with Aster and Looker. And when Looker is involved, you know something really bad is going to be going down. He introduces himself as a member of the International Police and says that he's been behind this Pokemon for years. It has the power to travel across space-time and he can't let it fall into the wrong hands. Its name is Dialabi and it's a relative of the actual Celebi. And while Celebi is able to time travel, this thing can travel across dimensions, which is a lot different and way more dangerous. As it turns out, it can create tiny little shrines that it uses as rest spots. But these can be incredibly dangerous because they can bring Pokemon from different dimensions here, which is not what we want. And it's incredibly hard to catch, that's why they brought me here, because I'm just a Pokemon master. So we end up approaching it and adding the data to our Pokedex. It does end up fleeing, but we can now track it on our map, as it's turned into a roaming Pokemon, which means we have to go and capture it and report back to Aster once we're done. So we say our goodbyes to Aster and Looker and head to Route 3 and 4, where we just go back and forth until Dialabi is on our route, which took way longer than it should have. Just because I don't want it to get away again, I lob my Master Ball at it, and straight after, I decide to evolve my new starter into Batnana, and after that into the majestic Vesper Fum. While I was threading the dangerous path of a volcano, I ended up running into the legendary Trishout, one of the two other chosen Pokemon, but we obviously went with Shyleon in our very first playthrough, but now we have the chance to battle this guy and all of its forms, and once you get to the final one, you have a chance to capture it. And I'm not going to lie, all all of his forms are crazy cool and I'm definitely starting to think that I picked the wrong starter. Just look at this fire behemoth and tell me this isn't peak Pokemon design. I do end up capturing it, go from a fiery landscape to a snowy one and end up in Borealis Town, the home of Neva, one of the elite four members of this game. She's really glad we came to visit her but doesn't have a lot of time. She introduces me to her palace which is something all the cardinals have. Cardinals are basically the same as elite four members by the way, they just protect the region. We can 
haven't visited yet, but when the time comes, we will be able to. But for now, she's going to have to head back to her duties at Mount Zodiac. But just before leaving, she gives me one last hint that we should head to Route 14 and enter one of the freezing dens there. So we follow her advice, and after almost freezing to death, we end up running into Shulong, the last starter Pokemon. And just like with Trisha, we have to battle all of its forms. And while the first three definitely didn't grab me, the last one, its legendary form is absolutely immaculate. And if I would have known it was designed like this, I would have picked this guy 100%. It's also a water dragon type, so it only has two weaknesses. And it looks like a really cool sea monster. So I named it Yunagi after that one monster from Avatar The Last Airbender. We end up running into one of the shrines that Dialabi placed. And this one brings us to a different dimension where Heatran is waiting for us. Another cool detail is that everything around you, including your sprite, changes to the corresponding region. So here we're in the Pokemon Platinum universe, which means everything has Gen 4 sprites. We then get a call from Taraxo to come and visit him because he's nearby and has a little bit of information for me. But first he wants to see with his very own eyes how strong we've become. My Electaburst was able to scorch and melt most of his Pokemon down until he brought out this new form of Porygon called Porygon West, which is one he designed himself. It ended up malfunctioning because I hit it with too many water type moves from Yanagi, and once we showed off our strength, he decides to give me the West update which allows me to get my very own Porygon West form and tells me to come and visit him in Polaris Town so that we can learn more about the situation that we're in. In order to start this, I first have to head to the Pokemon Center and pick up the Shinobi Ticket. With this, we can head to Shinobi Island by going to Samuel Oak Airport and immediately grabbing a plane. After arriving on this very weird and remote island, we can see that Taraxo and Looker were here all along waiting for me. They found one of the Dialabi Shrines and are very concerned about it because they thought they were done with all of this. But they're really happy that we finally arrived so that they can fill us in with what's been happening. Apparently, because all of those months ago we managed to defeat Dragalisk and end the Xenoverse, a ton of energy has been flowing into this region and it's caused Dialabi's portals to alter and shift. These alternations have brought these shrines here which lead to some very dangerous Pokemon lurking in them. And they're not only dangerous, they're also out of control and they're calling them Fury Pokemon. They're addicted to the energy emitted from the catastrophic event and are feeding off of it. So we have to go and stop them before they get too strong and cause even more trouble. That's because the international police wants to keep peace across the dimensions and they were looking for somebody to achieve that and they came to me. Since we saved the world once already, they're here to count on me once more. They need me to gather some more information about the Fury Pokemon behind this shrine, but these Fury Pokemon are way too strong to be captured in regular Pokeballs. So they teamed up with the Cardinals to create a device that could capture these Fury Pokemon and this device is called the Fury Seal. So they give it to me and order me to go in. For some of these battles, you can only take three Pokemon with you, which makes them incredibly hard. Shinobi Island reminds me a lot of Pokemon Bushido, and it definitely seems like it was made by ninjas or samurais, but at the end of the island, we see a very dangerous looking Greninja. It's a fire dark type now, and it's way stronger than any Greninja we've ever seen before. It's basically a boss battle because he has multiple health bars and he hits like a truck. I'm pretty sure these guys are maxed out EV and IV wise. But luckily, all your Pokemon do get put to level 100 too, so you're not at that big of a disadvantage. That doesn't really matter, however, because it still managed to defeat me more than five times. This frog is not messing around at all. Eventually, however, I was able to take it down with a critical hit bone Bonerang from Rexquiem. This activated the Fury Seal and sent Greninja straight to my Pokemon box. And I ended up finding out that it's a special attacker with the sniper ability and the move that always results in a critical hit. So definitely something I'm going to be adding to the team from now on. With my findings, I headed back to the Pokemon Center and picked up Aster's letter that he left behind for me. He needs me to come back to his lab to report on everything that we found out, so that's what we're doing right now. But the situation seems to have only gotten worse because the entire region has been affected now and they don't just affect X Pokemon but also some terrestrial Pokemon. On top of that, all of the energy that's been pouring out of the Xenoverse into Earth has caused a ton of Pokemon to be able to cause havoc by just mega evolving out of nowhere. It's been a very exclusive ability so far, only Aster and my father have been able to use it, but now it seems to be a worldwide phenomenon. He's already sent one of his new trainees up north to check out another Fury incident, and just when he's about to ask me to join him, something terrible happens. There's a gym in 
in this town and one of the gym trainers ends up running at us saying that something terrible has happened inside the gym. One of the Pokemon has gone rampant and is attacking everything. So we go and take a look and see that Basil's Venusaur has turned Mega and needs to be calmed down. So with the power of Greninja, Gojo and Noro, we managed to defeat the Mega Venusaur without much trouble and succeed in calming it down. As a thank you, Basil gives me the Venusaur right. Me and Aster head back to the lab and he orders me to go to Dorado Village because there's once again been a sight of one of these Fury Pokemon over there. We run into Ruta and his Decidueye here, but their dad is one of the Cardinals, but he's not here right now to protect the village, so we're going to have to do his job. Ruta speaks of the deadly Thunder Pokemon Raikou and that he's been sighted inside of this temple. But he can't calm it down and defeat it by himself, so he asks me for our help. We gladly agree and head inside. We find one of the shrines very quickly and once we touch it, we get turned into a Generation 2 sprite. Super cool. It really does feel like I'm in the Johto region right now and this is not just a straight path forward. You have to jump through dimensions so you can solve puzzles and complete this parkour until you eventually reach the Fury battle shrine which will send you to Raikou. We go to the top of the shrine here and all of a sudden Mega Raikou appears, not just a regular one. And he's not here for some small talk and tea, he's here to shock me. So me and Ruta team up to fight him and his pal Jolteon. All you really need for this battle is a ground type so I took Rexqueam and focused on Jolteon first to take it down with bone ranks, then started to go on Raikou with the bone ranks until it almost fell, then it took this boy and my Greninja down, so I sent out my Honchkrow to finish it off with Earthquake. I do have to mention that I really love this Mega Raikou form, and if they ever bring out a Legend Johto game or something like that, I hope that they give the Legendary Beasts new forms. Me and Ruta head back to Dorado Village, and I really want to hand Raikou to him so that he can show his father that he's become strong, but he doesn't accept, as his father told him that the three Legendary Beasts would eventually show up and follow the chosen trainer, which is clearly me, so he's going to to let it remain in my hands. Then we hear screams of help coming from down the village, so we go and check it out and see that it's our old enemy Gengar, the only Pokemon that can actually speak human language and can even make humans do its bidding, so it definitely isn't good that it's showing up here, but he says that he comes in peace and that he's totally left behind all of its evil past and is trying to live a better life with the seven gym leader who owns a circus where he's been working at. She's also the fire type gym leader and owns two Charizards and these two have gone absolutely insane with all of the fury energy and are destroying the circus and attacking all of the employees so we have to go and help out. So Gengar teleports me over there and the situation is way more heated than we thought. Both Charizard X and Charizard Y swoop down as they're holding the circus staff hostage. On top of that they think they're strong enough to take on the chosen ones so let's show them what real strength is. With some good ground type moves and the best water type Pokemon you could imagine, we splash some water in their face and calm them down. That's when two gems drop on the floor, the Charizard died Y and X, so we pick those up and add them to our Mega Stone collection. Gengar then takes us outside and explains to us that this is not good for the circus. It has taken major damage and he's going to try to get it back on its feet with its psychic powers, but we have to go to Henna in Fort Built Town to explain everything that happened to her. He doesn't really know why she's there, but it must be very important, so we will once again accept his request and head there straight away. But something terrible is happening here too. The entire town is on fire and Geist is here as well because they're helping out with their Blastoise to put all of the fires out. So we go and say hi to everybody and explain what happened in Vega City. As it turns out, the same thing has kind of been happening here. The entire town is just on fire and a lot of people have turned in requests to Geist to come and help them out. That's when Buster the Blastoise starts acting up and all of a sudden Mega evolves out of nowhere. He's got the look of death in his eye and is ready to strike me down. Minta tries to calm it down but it's of no avail and we have to defend ourselves so it's time to battle this big turtle. Because the sun was up this battle was actually very easy after bringing in Noro and spamming Giga Drain the Blastoise went down rather quickly. Our friend those thank us for helping out and also hand me the Blastoiseite. Guys heads back to the city to try and help out the people there because they're also still on fire and we ask Henna what we can do to help out. Abraham already told Henna about the fury energy Abraham being one of the Cardinals but this is the first time she can actually see it in action. She thinks all of this is because of the legendary Pokemon Entei and the Fury 
energy that it's gathered. So she takes me into the temple where Entei should reside and just like with Raikyu, we have to go through different dimensions, completing puzzles and parkours. But in the end, the heat is getting really overwhelming and it feels like you're actually in hell itself. So after entering the very last room of the temple, we finally see Entei in all of its glory. But just like Raikyu, it isn't here for a friendly chat, it's actually going to try and burn my hair off and make me bald. I guess that's what might have happened to Hena too. Entei was a lot harder to defeat than Raikyu. Because of the sun that was up, it was doing huge damage with Sacred Fire and it was boosting its attack with Howl. On top of that, its brother Flareon was always helping it out with hands. So there was only one thing I could do, set up Rain Dance and extinguish the volcano that's coming out of his back. With Entei calmed down, we managed to trap it with the power of the Fury Seal and all of the heat is starting to go away rapidly. We head back outside, meet up with Geist and tell them that everything is safe, which means that they can go back home. So we see our goodbyes and Henna is actually going to go back to Vega City to help out with the circus. And when she leaves, Aster shows up with a very weird character that we haven't seen before. He goes on to to explain that he's already found everything out because of Ruta and Gengar, so he knows that we've already managed to capture Raikou and Entei. But the Fury energy hasn't slowed down at all because there is a huge spike coming from Borelis City. But there is someone that might be able to help us. His name is Gold and he is an old friend of my parents. It's so cool to see this guy when he's older. I know there's a lot of people that think Gold is the best MC and I'm definitely going to put him in my top 3 and seeing him old like this just yeah, makes it even better. He's here to tell me that the situation in Borelis town is absolutely devastating, with incredibly freezing temperatures being recorded there, and if we don't get the situation under control, this could make for a new ice age. Aster then interrupts and says that we have to go to Borelis town immediately because he sent his trainee there, a very young guy, and he believes that if we don't interfere now, he might end up losing his life. He screams out the famous Yu-Gi-Oh quote, it should have been me, not him, but we tell him that he has nothing to worry about because we're about to save him. We head straight over there but the freezing temperatures have caused the entrance to be blocked by icy pointy blocks. Gold goes on to explain that the legendary beasts aren't native to this region, they're actually from the Johto region but these three are also not here from this dimension, they traveled here through Dialabi's portals. Hence why everything has been thrown into disarray and that's also why Aster has a Suicune of his own. Suicune also turns turns out to be the most dangerous of the three, although I am not sure about that because Entei's fire also seemed pretty dangerous. But because of the immense power that they've gathered, Gold isn't able to stop them and I'm the only one with the power to save everybody, so we put our Mega Entei in front of the icicles and melt them down which allows us to enter the Suicune Temple. Me and Aster go on the rescue mission while Gold decides to help out the citizens. We then run into Ginger which is the guy that the professor sent out as his train. Knee. He's relieved that we're here to help him, but he also got absolutely destroyed by this Suicune. It went back up to the top, blocking out every single escape route, and Aster then suggested they might have to go back to Hadwarf City to withdraw and recollect their thoughts, but Ginger isn't having any of that. He's here to stop that Suicune or die. Considering he's our friend, I don't want him to die, so we offer our help in taking down this majestic beast. He really appreciates my help and is ready to tackle this obstacle together. So so me and him head through the tower just like always, switching through dimensions and eventually running into the big beast. We only get one shot at taking it down and if we don't do it, we might as well freeze to death and the entire region might be doomed. But with both our fighting spirits being high, we are not going to give up here as the fire in our hearts will surely overcome the cold that this Suicune is radiating. Ginger himself really wasn't much of help in this battle, I'm not going to lie, I just needed my Mega Raikou to call mine up six times and then spam Discharge to take down this beautiful looking Suicune by the way. Can we just appreciate all of these beautiful new sprites? I really don't know which one I prefer of the three, but they need to exist in real life too. We then once again trigger our Fury Seal and capture Suicune to complete our Beast Trio. We both fall down from exhaustion of the cold, but Dialabi is able to teleport us out and Aster finds us and brings us back to the Pokemon Center. Aster 
Ginger then goes on to explain why he is actually taking Ginger under his wing. It's because he has such good grades and he's managed to graduate, but also because he reminds him of his younger self quite a bit. And he definitely seems to have made a good choice. We then head back to Hadwarf City to meet up with Gold and our father, and it just feels so right to see them reminisce about the old days. But Silver is also incredibly disappointed in himself because of him, all of this energy has gone into this world and the Fury Pokemon only exists because of him. But Aster has a different theory. He thinks all of this power has already existed and when the Xenoverse was destroyed, we just managed to awaken it. And it's really dangerous because he thinks that this might also affect humans like it did with my father back in the Xenoverse. Maybe we're playing with fire and we might risk a burn. If a powerful person actually gets taken over by this phenomenon, the entire world could be in danger. But because we now have the power of the three legendary beasts and Mega Evolution, we surely have more than enough strength to look over the region. And on top of that, everybody here is going to try their very best to help out to stop this phenomenon. We go back to the Pokemon Center where we meet up with Stella who tells me to go to Polaris Town because Taxaro has something to tell me once again. Upon entering his house, we see that Looker is here too. They already know everything about what happened with the Sacred Beasts and applaud me for my efforts in taking them down. But this definitely wasn't the end because they have managed to detect some really strange ways coming from the Sunflare Canyon. And they think this might correlate to the Fury Pokemon incident so we have to go and investigate but we won't be alone because the gym leader Casper and all of the team members of Geist are going to be helping us out, so we have to go and meet up at their hideout. As we arrive there, we see that Chrysler and the Sheriff are bickering already about where the waves could be coming from because Chrysler thinks that they come from underground, while the Sheriff says that they come from somewhere up above out of his sight, as he patrols the area regularly and hasn't ever seen a grain of dust out of place. In order to find out who of these two are right, we're going to have to investigate quite a lot ourselves, but we're not alone. Alone, the entirety of Team Geist is going to help us out and the Sheriff has the help of my dad with this. Because he once was the leader of Team Dimension and probably knows more than anybody at this point. Once everybody's off to the canyon, me and the Sheriff stay behind because he tells me that he doesn't trust my father one bit. He doesn't believe that he can just go from being a mob boss to a good guy so he's going to be keeping an eye on him for this entire operation. I can't say I blame him but I trust my father at this point so we leave the Sheriff Sheriff behind and head to the canyon to look for these strange waves. I ended up doing my very first Trish out then, even though I got blasted out a couple of times by Milotix, I still managed to get to the end. I then ended up in a cave system that eventually led me to the throne of the god of Pokemon, Luxflon. He is the protector of the earth. He saved me and all of my friends from Dragalisk in the Xenoverse, but now it's time for us to have him by our side forever by trapping him in a teeny tiny Ultra Ball. After this, I found a switch that led me to a secret laboratory that's overgrown with plants and just altogether seems very abandoned. But the ventilation and water systems seem to be working fine so this thing might not be abandoned after all. We're going to have to check it out with the gang. And our father doesn't seem to recognize this as one of Team Dimension's bases because they have strict regulations where everything needs to be in order and this place just isn't in order at all. So we make our way underground until we reach the stairs that take us to the next level. That's when our robot detects hostiles and it seemed to be Xenoverse Dittos. Our father and Team Dimension used to experiment with these guys and now they're super dangerous. They don't need to see a target in order to transform into them so they can just think of any Pokemon and transform into it. These two end up turning into the first two ex-Pokemon we ever faced, Sharpedo and Elekid. So me and Revolver decide to take them on in a battle together. But we have the big brother of Elekid, Electaburst, and together with my starter Pokemon, we can starburst them out of this cave and after they're defeated, they turn back into Dittos and flee the scene. In order to ensure our safety, we leave Revolver behind so that he can deal with any more intruders while we go to the next level. This level is full of traps and if you end up stepping on the wrong color, you get sent back to the beginning of the floor, so you have to use switches that are all around to create a path forward. Down here, we also found some very cool information about how certain X-Pokemon are made like Bisharp and Scovile. 
which we both ended up fighting in the battles against the Team Dimension admins. Once again, we get to the end of the level, two Ditto show up, these two turn into Gengar and Galvantula, only this time Gengar can't talk. And after dealing with them swiftly, we leave behind Chrysler, head to the next floor, complete the puzzles there once again, and of course we run into two more Dittos, this time they turn into Slurpuff and Rapidash. We take them on together with the Sheriff, leave the Sheriff behind once we're done, and go to the last floor with our father. On this last floor, you have to remember some patterns and then walk on the right tiles once you've remembered them. If you run into a wrong tile, you get sent back to the beginning, so you better get your memory working right. And after playing so much Pokemon, mine is basically gone at this point, but we still managed to get to the end where we run into the final two Dittos, and these turn into the aces of my father and his second in command, namely the special forms of Mewtwo and Rose Raid. And boy, were these guys hard to beat. The only reason I was able to get through this fight was because I toxic them with my very own Rose Raid and was able to stall them out with Lux Flong. Once that is over, we make our way through a very obscure and scary area where all of their used robots are just standing broken like they haven't been touched in years. At the end of the line of broken robots, you meet up with your father, who thinks this next room that's coming up is the last one, so we make sure that we're all prepared and head in together. We end up in the residential area of the laboratory. Each and every one of their laboratories had one of these areas so that their scientists could live here. My father doesn't want to stay here too long because some bad memories are haunting him. But once we reach the final house, we end up running into Victor. He's going mad because he's trying to find a way to bring Trey back to this dimension. Trey was actually the second chosen one and our rival, but also one of our very best friends in the end. He was part cyborg and ended up sacrificing himself to take down Dragalisk. But he stayed behind in the Xenoverse and I guess he's trying to bring him back somehow. But Dahlia, who's in love with Victor, says that he has to rest because it's been days since he's even slept. That's when Victor seems to get taken over by the Xenoverse energy and he scolds at Dahlia to leave him alone because she's a traitor just like Versil, my father. He goes on to say that it's his fault that his wife is dead. And on top of that, he doesn't want the pain of losing Trey as well because he was kind of like a son to him. He goes on to attack Dahlia, but we jump in and he isn't too pleased with that because he blames my father for everything that happened to his wife, Trey, and all of the other things that he's committed. He just can't forgive my father that he wants to live a normal life after all of this, but it very much seems like there's something wrong with him. So my father says that he's out of his mind and that Trey is never coming back because he blew himself up in order to save us all. That's when Victor goes absolutely crazy, turns purple pinkish, and blasts us all away. Dahlia then jumps in and says that she will remain by his side forever to suppress all of these awful memories, but Victor doesn't even listen to her and that's when she gets really mad and throws out all her feelings about how she's not good enough, how she'll never be able to live up to his wife, but that she's always tried her best to remain by his side and be a loyal companion companion and she's just tired of being ignored and heartbroken. And just before she wants to put an end to this all, this weird purple energy takes over her body and she transforms into another being. This is not Dahlia anymore, this creature, or whatever it is, wants to speak to the Chosen One. It was forced to reincarnate in this woman, but she doesn't want to stay in this form for very long, she's just here as a counselor because she wants us to drop our weapons and surrender to it. Because all of humanity is powerless against the energy of fury and it's going to show me what it means by throwing it all out in a Pokemon battle. And she does seem to have a point because all of her Pokemon have multiple health bars making them a lot harder to take down but I do have the legendary protector of earth on my side. And with moves like Geomancy and Recover I can easily put my special attack, special defense and speed to the max while healing up when necessary. Then I can use Astral Lance which is a move that always critical hits to take down every single one of her team members and destroy any grain of hope she had left. I try to capture this weird power that has taken over Dahlia with my fury seal but it can't contain it and breaks into a million pieces. He then goes on to say that I'm definitely stronger than the rest of my species, that I should stop fighting this phenomenon because it's already a miracle that I'm still alive. Then chants Chaos Omnia Impera and leaves the body not to be seen again. At least for now, Dahlia seems to be okay, and Victor also comes back to his senses, but he seems to have forgotten everything that happened. He doesn't know where he is, he doesn't know what happened. The only thing he remembers is that he came here to 
look for information on dimensions. So he asks Dahlia to remind him why they were actually here, but she isn't responding. Even after shaking her around and trying to get any word out of her, she still doesn't respond. And the cutscene ends on Dahlia. Dot, dot, dot. A couple of days pass and we wake up back in our bedroom and upon going downstairs, our father and Looker are here to inform us about everything that happened. Unfortunately, the sentence Chaos Omnia Impera can be found in any text nor in any library, it's just not available, so we have no idea what that entity even meant by it. The only people that might know something about it are the four Zodiacs, the protectors of this region, but they are currently unavailable because they are on top of Mount Zodiac performing a ritual of some kind. So before we can go and see them, Looker asks me to come by once again and see what we can do in order to spin this in our favor. Our father on the other hand is going to stay home because he feels like he's not as useful on the battlefield anymore, but since we did unlock the power of Mega Evolution, he does allow me to get a Mega Stone from his Weavile. We then get a call that we need to come to Ishtar City. Joel was waiting here for me, he's one of the guards of the princess, and he informs me that she wants to see me, so we go up to her, and she starts reminiscing about the old days that we managed to save this town by getting rid of Gengar, but the main reason she asks me here is because she wants me to check up on the Cardinal's ritual. She needs to know if it's proceeding as expected to, as they have to do it every five years and it's incredibly tiring. It can even strip them from all of their energy and the ritual has been going on for far longer than usual, so something must be up. Her grandpa is also one of the cardinals and she's very worried about him, so she needs me to check up on them, but before we do that we have to go by Looker to see what's up there, and we also have to inform him about everything that's going on with the cardinals. He's not the only one that's been waiting for us, Taxaro and Alice are here too, they're going to help us out with all of this. Looker has even worked together with Alice in the past already because of her abilities, and on top of that she has already done assignments for him. This is also how her journey through Johto and Kanto started, hence why we haven't seen her in a couple of months. Alice was able to get a ton of useful information, but eventually it all led to a dead track, so that's why they called her back here, so we have more brains on this operation right now. But that's not the reason they called me here, it's because my fury seal broke back at the bunker, and they managed to fix that. They created a Pokeball that can capture any fury Pokemon without fail, but we only have one of them, so I have to make sure I use it on the right one. On top of that, they also made a plan B, another fury seal that I can use to capture regular Fury Pokemon. After explaining to them that we have to go check up on the Cardinals, Alice decides to come with me so that we can bust this task out quickly. After arriving at Mount Zodiac, we see that the entrance is looking very weird, like a different dimension type thing, but it also kind of resembles a mirror with a strange color. We try to enter it, but that sends us back to the island that we were just on and basically puts us in a time loop because the same events keep on happening over and over again and somehow we have to break this. So we have the same conversation we just had but then we tell Alice to not touch that mirror no matter what. We tell everything to Taraxo as well and he says that there might be somebody in Milky Way City that can help us out about a legend Pokemon that can break these kind of barriers. We go up to the castle there and talk to Armand which is the butler of the Queen. We go and ask about this certain Pokemon and he says it has something to do with the very first king but he can't really speak on it himself so he goes to the princess to ask for permission. She accepts and we get led into the Trome room to listen to her story. A long time ago there was a man that was so good for his people that they actually went and followed him and called him king. However, during his reign a Pokemon attacked a ton of villages and this turns out to be the very first ex-Pokemon Aegislash. The king had to do everything in his power to defend his kingdom and took on the Aegislash. They battled for days upon end and in the end the king managed to tame the mighty beast and it became its companion. The place where their battle took place would later be called Victory Road, but many years later, once the king passed away, Aegislash went back to this place and went into a slumber until the day that somebody would be able to tame it once again, because in all these years it has not been woken up yet. And that's what they want us to do, so they give me the location, and while we are going to go and wake up Aegislash, Alice is going to go back to Mount Zodiac to check if anything weird is going on there, and she'll be waiting for us until we're done. So we split up and go to the 
the deepest depths of the Victory Road. Over here we see Aegis Slash X in all of its glory, and we're going to be taking it on. Since this is a ghost fairy type, we just sit up with Lux Flan and end up taking it out with a couple of Astral Lances. We don't even have to lob a ball at it, as our seal just captures it for us. And with the legendary Hammer of Thor by my side, I could smash that wall up at Mount Zodiac and enter it together with Alice. But everything here seems to be totally screwed up and weird. Nothing looks the same anymore. All the colors are weird and shifted. There is weird waterfalls running everywhere. And the Pokemon League staff is strapped here as well. They want us to save them and save all of the Cardinals because their ritual did indeed go wrong. And in exchange for all this, they will provide me with their goods and services. So after stocking up and getting ourselves ready, we head into the portal that brings us to the Cardinals. But once we enter these black kind of areas, Areas, something terrible happens. We turn into our alter self and our entire control panel is adverse. So if I try to go up, I go down. And if I go left, I go right. A little bit annoying, but definitely something I can deal with. I just hope our alter form isn't going to do anything radical or harsh when he has control over our body. Even Alice senses that something's wrong with me, but doesn't go along with it too much and just leaves me alone. I turn on a switch which opens up the next portal and in here it feels like we've just entered the mind of a madman. We run into Chua and he's in trouble. His Tapu Fini has gone berserk and is attacking everything. He's trying to calm it down, but he doesn't have much strength left. So we tell him to tap out and let me fight the beast. And there is only one way I can take down this boss Pokemon, and that's by toxing it with Rose Raid and then sending in Luxflon, set up my Geomancies, and killing it with Astral Lances. Once this is defeated, we manage to trap it once again with the Fury Seal, and now we basically just stole his Pokemon. Chua thanks us for coming along just at the right time because an invader has started attacking Mount Zodiac. And every five years, the Cardinals do this ritual to contain the Fury energy so that it doesn't go leaping out into the rest of the Earth. He knows that the other Cardinals are also under attack, so we have to go and save him, and he's going to stay behind to try and finish the ritual. He also starts doubting himself as a Cardinal and wonders if he should pass on the torch to someone who's actually worthy of it. But we try to cheer him up with some kind words and then head into the next portal. This brought us to another level of puzzles. This time you have to do ice puzzles. On top of that, there is holograms of you here, and if you run into them the wrong way, they will send you back to the beginning of the level. It took me about an hour to get through here, but eventually I was able to get to the end and meet with the second cardinal, Neva. She seems to be stuck in a time loop because every time she attacks it, she gets sent right back to the beginning and talks to us, saying that she's in trouble. So we jump in ourselves and defeat the Tabulele with the toxic Luke's long strategy once more. The same thing that happened to Chua happened to her, so she knows that the other two Cardinals must be in trouble as well and orders us to go and save them, but then collapses because she's so tired. We enter the next portal and this puzzle is even harder than the last one. You need to make sure you don't run on these eye-like tiles on the wall, because if you do, you once again get sent back to the beginning, which basically traps you in a time loop as well if you think about it. And these only get harder and harder the further you get in this level. It's like I'm actually playing some kind of puzzle game, and I don't like puzzle games myself. I do output 100% of my brain capacity and once again overcome this challenge. Here we see Peyote being in a stalemate with Tapu Kogo and we have to try and free him. So we destroy his beloved island guardian the same way as we did the other two. We trap the star of Pokemon Sun and Moon in the seal once again and inform Peyote of everything that happened and he tells me that we should go ahead and team up with Abraham because he's super strong and that there is absolutely no way he's going to lose to his Tapu Bulo. So we enter the final trial and here we have to face our very best friend Alice. You have to chase her through different dimensions like Generation 2, and on top of that, she will throw all of her deepest insecurities and problems at you, making you doubt yourself and her as well. But in the end, if you overcome all of these obstacles, you get faced with one final challenge. Two Alice's. You have to pick the right one, and we just don't. We pick the fake one, and they end up getting mad at us because we can't recognize our real friend. As a punishment, you have to face them in a double battle, but you know what? Raikou do be calm-minding though. And then they 
all just fall and get shocked and that's the end of Alice. We win this battle, step through the portal, she ends up forgiving me, and we meet up with the last cardinal, Abraham. Abraham is actually passed out from the battle, so we take on Tapu Bulu ourselves without his help. This time, I do Toxic with Rose Raid, and then I swap in Aegis Slash to take it out with a couple of play roughs because it doesn't seem to be able to touch me because it keeps on spamming Outrage. Glory to the fairy type. We trap Bulu in the Shadow Realm, but Abraham doesn't wake up yet, and Alice isn't sure that we can even do this. She even suggests to head back to Peyote so that we can try to get out of this realm first. But I'm not a person that's going to give up, so we head to the final throne room all by ourselves. This final room seems to be very empty and weird, like there's no emotion here. And we hear a voice saying, you came, finally. And as we start walking on the bridge, he says that it's not polite to let somebody wait, but we're a special case, so he's going to let it slide. He seems to teleport me to another bridge, and this one takes me across my entire journey from the start when I got my first Pokemon, defeating my very first gym badge and saving people, to the evolution of my starter Pokemon, even though it turned its back on me and started attacking me, I still managed to convince it to stay by my side, and it became my most loyal companion. And then struggling with my alter self, and letting it take over in moments of rage, but in the end still being able to overcome it. From defeating Team dimension and saving the earth from Dragalisk, we did it all and look back on it one last time before facing this final being. We step into the last portal and end up in the event horizon. The voice starts talking to me again and tells me to join him here at the zenith. We go up to him, but we don't seem to recognize him at all. The last time we met him, he looked like a woman, which means this is the guy that took over the commander last time, but he's actually an entity that powered and nourished, now eons ago, a planetary circle at some light year from Earth. Yeah, that didn't make sense to me either. Anyway, he's this big ball that we fought in our very last battle against Dragalisk. But humans just call him Vacuum. He took this form because last time we just attacked him out of nowhere and he didn't want that to happen this time. He seems to not like humans very much because he thinks that they just attack anything that's unknown to them, which in some cases is definitely true, but obviously not everybody's like that. He created this body with the so-called fury energy that we've basically been talking about this whole video. He's the one that made it exist in the first place anyway, and everything that led up to this point has all been his doing. This place that we're at right now actually shouldn't exist at all, it only exists outside of reality. It's also full of all kinds of energy energy and the person that is in this place can control it and bend it to its will, but the only kinds of beings that are able to do this are the ones that are perfectly balanced, but since our alter form isn't really liking us at the moment, we aren't one of those perfect beings. But Vacuum himself is also not suitable to this, because a long time ago he split off of Luxflon, which had thrown him completely out of balance, and that's where we come in, we're actually the perfect vessel for him to resist in so that he can control this place and shape everything to his heart's being. It even looks like I'm connected to a higher plane of existence, even higher than of an almighty being such as himself. He then says, don't you sense it? There's somebody looking at us even in this moment. Join me, champions we go, chosen one, savior. Once together, I intend to make this universe balanced and make it so that everything is back to its rightful place. And that's when we find vacuum the creator. I do be going with the Geomancy and recover strats on Luxflon, then kill that Egorgion with Astral Lance, and then for some reason he just has the four genies, Enamorous, Landorus, Thunderous, and Tornadus, so Luxflon shows off its godly powers once more and wins me this battle against Vacuum. But it isn't over yet, because he says that ants can't do anything against giants, and then summons a weird Dragalisk hologram form? And you know what happens by now, we use Toxic with Rose Raid. However, Greninja does come in after that and just fire kunai's a couple of times in order to take down Dragalisk. After the battle, Vacuum says that this is not Dragalisk at all, because the cyborg that we knew, Trey, actually blew that part of him up, and it's honestly not recoverable anymore. This was only a projection, the real Pokemon is coming right now. The strain starts shaking and the dimension starts to collapse somehow, but then it shows up 
the real form of Dragalisk. One of the strongest Pokemon to ever exist, so let's see if we can take this big boy down too. I was able to get off a Toxic Rose Raid, but then when I threw out Luxflon, I just got critted and one-shot, so my strategy isn't going to work for this battle. It also took down Excaliham with just one hit, as well as Raikou and Greninja, so I decided to just revive my Luxflon in order to win this battle and not lose. Might have been a bit cheesy, but it was necessary. I mean, you don't become champion of the Pokemon League without spamming full restore. Stores. After this, we can defeat Dragalisk with the toxic damage. That's when we throw our Fury Ball and capture Dragalisk. Vacuum says, once again, the living beings find a way to avoid calamity. This wasn't planned, but I don't see any alternative. The reality starts shifting, the screen goes black, and the credits start rolling. And we wake up in our bedroom once more. As we head downstairs, we meet up with Alice and our mother, who say that we've managed to defeat the invader from Mount Zoniac and saved everyone once again. But I was passed out once they found me, and they brought me here to rest up. Mother also mentions that father is really proud of us for saving everybody once again, but he's not home right now, but we'll meet up with him later. Dahlia has also woken up, so maybe they can finally be a family together with Victor. But something feels a little bit off, so we decide to head to the circus that was formerly a gym. This time it's been turned into an Apollo tournament, and Gengar seems to be the boss of it all. He goes on to greet me and explains everything that's going on. He can join different tournaments in order to win prizes and stuff like that. And he's also able to control everything in this circus tent with just his psychic abilities. He encourages me to join because I would obviously make the crowd very happy. And there's a couple of tournaments I can enter here, but I decide to go with the memory tournament. Inside, he can only use three Pokemon, so I decide to go with Rose Raid, Noro, and Gojo. They throw you into the makeup room, and once you're done getting all pretty and dressed up, you have to walk the red carpet up to your battle. And the first person we're facing here is Looker. He's not really a battler, he's more of an investigator, so he just investigates this L he just took as we move on to round two straight away where our father is our next opponent. Really weird to see him here. We've already managed to defeat him in his prime, so this was only easier with Noro blasting him out of here with Starburst. As we move on to our final round, Dre all of a sudden steps up to the battlefield and I don't understand why because he's not supposed to be here at all. I'm not going to question it too much because maybe this is just a tournament and anybody can show up. But yeah, we defeated him many times in the past and it's time to do it once more as our Rose Raid takes down his Rapidash that we've managed to capture together. Then it's the Clash of the Starters and mine comes out victorious because Earth Power is just too much for him to handle and the last thing on his team is Scizor, whom we obliterate with a Flare Blitz from Gojo. Once the battle over, Trey says that we seem to have noticed nothing so far. We don't find anything strange? I'm not supposed to be here, that's what he is saying. I open my eyes, but I'm not in possession of my own body anymore. I can see my surroundings, and I finally understand where I am. I see that sad and desolate landscape that more than once I found myself observing. The time does not pass and I have not heard a word for days and days, but I am forced to wander in that wasteland without a real goal. Until all of a sudden I feel angry and resentful. In that moment I finally understand what I'm really looking at. I see everything through the eyes of my alter self. I wake up next to my bed as a little kid, but nobody's here to greet me or save me. I don't have any family or friends. And as I wander these decayed wastelands, I eventually run into my good self who's picking up his first Pokemon with his father. As this version of myself, I am incredibly resentful and hateful towards him because I'm jealous, I want all that he has, but I have to do everything myself because there's no one here but me. The moment that my father disappeared, an unstoppable flow of negative emotions kept on tormenting me, and I can finally hear my own voice as I mumble words that are only full of hatred. We end up in the first gym as our alter self, and he thinks he's going to achieve greater high because he's just stronger than me, and he's going to prove it. See, normally when you run into one of the Trevenants in this gym, they throw you out, but he's so strong that he just takes them head on and defeats them. Just like my regular self defeated Basil on his very first try, my alter self actually did the same with his Shyleon. Even though I'd run out of moves except for Absorb, he was really easy to beat. Shyleon is insanely strong, way stronger than the regular Shyleon I'm working with. After defeating Basil, he finds me rescuing that Lapras 
who then takes me to the abandoned shipwreck where we fight the x Sharpedo for the first time. He does the same thing and just like me defeats it first try, but obviously nobody acknowledges that. But this is one of the first times my real self was actually happy and happy emotions weaken my alter form while hatred strengthens it. So paradoxical as it may be, the one who hated you the most was the one who made the most of your happiness. After this we go to the place in the school where we first evolved our starter, but this didn't happen to my alter self, he stayed behind with that shyly on base form. He did end up fighting with me against the two admins, but that's not something we experienced in our world. After the battle I say that I'm the best, I'm the best, but why do you always have to be the favorite while I'm here alone? Back with the Gengar event where he took over the entire city, he was finally resonating with somebody, he understood that the people here don't deserve better, but he was still going to prove that he was stronger than this Gengar, so he once again defeated it. Just as he guessed, I am once again being hailed for no reason at all, and that's what he hates the most. But he can feel that there will be a time where he can actually face and crush me, and that's the moment that my alter self will hopefully never forget. A couple of months later, this moment finally arrives as we meet in the Xenoverse for the first time ever. He says that he has been waiting for this moment for so long and that he needs no introductions because he is me. Just without all of the good things like the friends and family and the only thing he really hates is me. He challenges me to a battle and in his world he seems to have won, while in mine he totally lost. And that's when the screen starts flickering and we get sent once again to this weird dimension that doesn't exist. A voice starts talking to me once again asking if I had a good nap because I've only been asleep for a couple of hours even though it felt like days. The weird part is that all of these things that I just saw in my dream as my alter self were the missing part to make myself a fully balanced being. With that, we can step up to our very final confrontation here, as we approach the finale of Pokemon Xenoverse. We run up to this weird silhouette who says that the only reason we're still here is because of our alter form. He saved us, even though his hatred for us is so deep. He turns around and asks me if we know his name by now, and obviously it's once again vacuum, only this time he has taken over my body. All of these things we saw in our regular world, like waking up in our room, greeting our mother, going through the tournament, they were all fake illusions that he set up, because that would be the perfect world. And running into Trey like that, and seeing our alter form struggle, made us snap back into reality and fight the takeover of Vacuum. Vacuum says that my last barrier is down, so we can't resist him anymore and tries to snap me out of existence Thanos style. But for some reason it's malfunctioning, I still have the will to stay alive and fight Vacuum the creator himself and it's all because of the friends and family we've made along the way. They believe in me, I'm always on their minds, I am the savior of most of these people and most of them also know me as one of their best friends. And that's something you can't just snap out of existence. I'm the first one that's been able to stand up the Vacuum like this, so he challenges me to one last battle, and I guess the winner gets to create whatever they want. So we're not stopping here, there's way too much at stake, time to take down this weird creature. He fights you with the exact same team as you bring to this battle, so it's honestly just a matter of you being smarter than him. We start off great, our Roserade takes out his with a sludge bomb and two hyper voices. His Sapo Coco then finishes me off with a thunderbolt, I bring in Dragalisk and go for the Void Star, but he brings in Luke's Flan, who avoids the attack and takes me out the next turn with Astral Lance. So I bring out my very own Luke's Flan because it's honestly the only thing that can win against his. I start spamming Earth Power and end up taking it out. So able to set up a recover as the Tapu Koko comes in. I finish it off with one Astral Lance, take out the next Pokemon Gojo with Earth Power, Dragalisk falls the same way as mine fell, and with one final Astral Lance, my starter also gets defeated. The perfect way to end the perfect fight. With that, Vacuum says the final words, it's not, and then his sentence gets cut off and everybody disappears and I am face to face with my alter form, who says you finally
finally made it, huh? You definitely took your time sleeping, dumbass. What you experienced is what I experienced before we met. And I bet you had a big laugh seeing me like that, huh? And I see that you're wondering why I shielded you from vacuum. I mean, you know how much I hate you, but the very idea of becoming a puppet of sorts grinds me even more. Moreover, in that hell, you were the only one to keep me company. So don't think too hard about it. But now it's time to get back together with you, huh? Turns out it's not so bad, you know. And all is well, that ends well. We look behind us, and all of a sudden, we see Trey, who says that it's been a while. And if nothing else, I'm still the same. He says that I took way too long, that it would have taken him only half of the time. Typical Trey. See, with these kind of moments, you can really see why Trey is my favorite character in Xenoverse. He has so much character and growth throughout the entire story. He is really the best rival out there. I try to get the words out, but just before I can even say my first sentence, Trey says that I shouldn't waste my time talking because it's honestly not like me. He does ask, what am I going to do with all of the fury energy? If I don't get rid of it, vacuum will definitely come back. And then he goes on to suggest that I should bring back the Xenoverse. It's by far the best way to get rid of all the fury energy and restore the balance. But we are worried about him, but he says not to worry at all. Because Dragalisk is gone, and as for him, he'll be alright. I should worry about myself rather, and he really means that. So we do exactly that, we recreate the Xenoverse and go back to our own reality, and the last words that Trey says to me are, I almost forgot. Hey Zwiggo, you really are the strongest. And that is the final ending of Pokemon Xenoverse.